Because the education environmental project that we are running with uh, uh, with youth, uh, in this project we engage youth in citizen science when they go to the forest, collect data and upload it for the use of scientists and for the use of their communities and their peers and they create stories based on the analysis of this data. Uh, so I'm really keen to uh, find more about uh, the work that um, is going to, to be introduced during the session. Uh, the chair uh, is uh, Stefan Fritz, and uh, he is from um, International Institute of Applied uh, System Analysis, and he is a deputy director of o uh, Ecosystem Services and Management. And I invite him on the podium. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. I'm going to get to my presentation, which is about non-traditional approaches. I think here in this um, place, we've heard many things about the non-traditional approaches, about the data revolution, about all the different aspects um, which are currently going on simultaneously. And we hear terms such as, you know, the fourth um, revolution we are in, um, and that very soon um, robots will be bringing us the food instead of um, us having to go there collecting it, for example. So there will be a lot happening uh, for sure, and there is, of course, big potential also for um, using this data, the big data, and the big data revolution for addressing the SDGs. And I want to start with one quote which I heard yesterday in the session by Robert Kirkpatrick, he said that we are all talking about privacy, we are all talking about that people are afraid in sharing some of their data and there are now rules in place and laws, especially the Commission has just introduced this very famous law called GDPR with a lot of people we are fighting with. And that's, I think, one aspect of the coin, but the other aspect we must mentioning what we are not mentioning is how many lives we could actually save by getting access to the data and how much damage is actually done by not releasing this data because of privacy concerns. That doesn't mean we can release all data, but I think the point to be made here is that we need to invest in technologies to anonymize data that people feel comfortable, but at the same time that the data is released. I think this is a very important point which I got as a take-home message from this yesterday's session. But coming back to where I'm from, I'm from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, um, and there are different research programs. This is a very interesting research institute which was founded in 72 by the former Soviet Union and the United States to do common research and work together on global problems. Um, global problems of development and sustainable development, that hasn't changed and there are still a lot of problems to be solved. But the Institute is known to look into the future, making models to uh, project energy demand and life, um, livestock, fish stock, land use, land use change, air pollution projections and so forth. And I'm part of the ecosystem services and management programs where we have four centers and one center is called Center for Earth Observation and Citizen Science. And we've just actually founded this center and we work on the one hand on earth observation uh, where we look also at global data sets specifically in the land use and land cover side, oil plant mapping and so forth. But we are also engaging in citizen science projects and campaigns. And in particular, we are developing a lot of tools such as smartphone data collection tools in different aspects, primarily in the field of environmental modeling, uh, monitoring. Um, 
I just want to come back to the current issues we have uh, with traditional data and traditional approaches. Some of these problems have already been mentioned. So there is, of course, the problem of coverage. Many times there is not enough data being collected. It's not disaggregated to the level needed. But also many times there is um, the data itself is outdated and it's not really frequently collected to the needs. Um, but also many times data is biased. I can tell you one example in northern Kenya. So northern Kenya is extremely remote and the, the surveyors and the enumerators, they can't get there because it's just too remote and it would be too expensive. So what they do, they send out questionnaires to people which they have to answer. But the people know that the resource allocation in the country is done based on population counts, population no numbers. So they will try to inflate those numbers, of course, because the resource, resource allocation given to them will be likely higher if the population number is higher. So there are also in the traditional approaches biases. Uh, so there are biases in all data, not just potentially in citizen science data. This is the point here to be made. And traditional approaches are expensive, not always accessible also to citizens. They are not spatially explicit. So here is the problem. You don't really know where the issues are, but with spatially explicit data, and many times also citizen science data is spatially explicit, you can understand where the issues and the problems are, for example. So just to show you some statistics, when you plot from Global Data Watch, unfortunately you can't see this so well, I know, uh, um, some access on coverage and frequency. So frequency means these parameters percentage of parameters collected in the last five years and you will see Africa I don't know if you can read this well but this is actually broken down even by country but I just want to stay here on the upper upper left so um, the red smaller ball below the green one is, is Africa and that is not surprising so Africa is much lacking behind having the capacity really to to collect collect data and is under 50%. So 50% um, of the parameters are not collected in the last five years. And the coverage, which means the amount of variables collected are also less than 50%, just to show that there is a big discrepancy globally in this um, data collection and availability of data. So even if it was a tier one indicator, um, or tier two one, there is many times this big data gap. Coming back to the non-traditional approaches, we have um, existing government agency data. So there were a lot of points made in the last two days that agencies need to talk to each other. Uh, many times data is actually collected, but it's not exchanged within the agencies. But also there is traditional local knowledge we should become part of the official data collection strategy. And of course, last but not least, there is this whole uh, piece of big data, of financial data. Um, and I want to give you an example there. There's the Internet of Things, there's social media data, many times also spatially explicit. There is this whole field of sensors, different types of sensors. This can be also very simple sensors could be water measurements, which people are just reading, which we've heard before, but it could also be quite sophisticated uh, measurements of air quality, for example. Then we have this area of mobile phone data, which we've seen in the past two days has massive and big potential and has a lot of applications. And I will show you some here as well. And as well, we have satellite data, satellite data being spatially explicit by nature. And we have the big issue here of all of this big data that a lot of this big data until now is only partially shared. Um, and it's many times in the hands of companies. Um, they hold the data, telecommunication companies in particular for phone data, and they're 
could be a big benefit for society if this data was made available and shared. And there are initiatives underway to facilitate that, but it's not um, yet happening and much more can be done. And of course, the privacy issues need to be addressed. Um, and that is really an important element that um, this anonymization can be done. Coming back to some examples we have from financial data, so that is really, really recent where UN Global Pulse have been working with companies where they have been an example um, where financial data has measured the economic resilience to disasters. And this is really incredible. And it shows that there is still much more which can be done. And I've been in the presentation and the person said, um, first they said, are you crazy? You're giving out your data to a university to analyze it. But then um, seeing all the benefits of doing that, uh, people would agree that there is such a massive benefit in that. Another example when you can use just internet searches, um, there's some work we've been done at Yasa, it's just looking where is currently corn grown in the US. And then you look by states, just account on the search term corn, and you will see an interesting match between the two. So where people search for corn, that's where corn is actually grown. But this is very interesting because you can use this also to understand crop calendars. Crop calendar data is currently globally lacking. We don't know in a lot of countries what is actually the crop calendar, when which crop is grown where. This can help, for example. Then the area of mobile data. Um, and there has been a very good report by UN Global Pulse just recently released. And there are many examples. So predicting dengue fever more quickly in Pakistan, use the anonymized call data and mobile data. Other example would be tracking human migration in Nepal following earthquake and earthquake, understanding population displacement with mobile data, mobile data to improve transportation system, mobile data as a proxy for census maps. So there are many examples and many areas and fields where mobile data can have an added value and really uh, change some of the data needs in the country. Another example, also what we've been doing at YASA is uh, we for the, for the first time looked into poverty mapping in, who knows, North Korea, this is North Korea, um, which is an extremely data poor country. We know it's a poor country, but we as well, um, but it's very data poor. There's very little data coming out. But for example, nighttime lights data can tell you where might be some more economic activity. And many times nighttime light data has been used as a proxy for economic activity and wealth, some indicator of wealth as well. And you see the dark areas, the black areas, this is where there is zero light, there is nothing. But we know from some latest remotely sense-based data set coming out from DLR that there are actually settlements on these black spots and there is no light. So we know these areas are likely to be very poor because there is no light. What is becoming more and more interesting is really looking at the intersection of this data. So using this data together, using these data streams which exist together and combine them, put them together and make best use of them. And I want to show you one, one other example uh, what we've been doing at, at our institute. And this is to produce a poverty map of Senegal um, and validating this, but also using training data from the digital household survey. So digital household survey is a traditional data method. And we trained, um, we trained a Bayesian network. You could also use machine learning, but in this case, um, a Bayesian network was used. And we uh, used additionally call data. So we won the uh, uh, one challenge with Orange, where Orange said, you have to make a strong case and we give you out the data. And we managed to use a number of variables from these towers, which is the Orange mobile data, uh, where you, you can infer to um, poverty, poverty levels. So for example, how many calls a person makes, 
how high the top up rates are of the calls made um, and to then top this up. Um, the entropy to how many people you, you call. This, these are things which are indicators of, of, of poverty, for example. And we found a statistical relationship and we could use the digital household survey to validate and to also train this Bayesian network. And we added a lot of other um, geospatial data sets such as accessibility uh, and we found that um, all those um, indicators including nighttime lights do make a difference and are significant in explaining poverty levels in Senegal for example. Um, coming back to citizen science and here I'm already starting to hand over to my colleague Dilek Fraser. There is um, a lot of work being done in the field of citizen observations and one big success for story is the GBIF database. So more than half of this GDIF database, which collects abundance data on a lot of species, but it's very much driven by bird watchers and the bird community. Um, more than 50%, around 60% are populated by citizen observations. And it's, it's really massive. Um, it's 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 many uh, many of many observations and and millions and millions actually a billion ops more than a billion observations which have been acquired in in this database and this database is also used for monitoring with respect to species loss ACHI target number 19 for example so that has really some some impact also on on global reporting needs and here is the question. Citizen science, as we've heard previously in the previous talks, many talks, has a lot of success stories, has a lot of examples, but it can also intersect very nicely with these um, other non-traditional data streams in these ecosystems of non-traditional data streams and traditional data streams as well. For example, and we've already heard that, um, citizen science data can be used as calibration and validation data for earth observation and that potential has not yet been fully realized there's still much more which can be done and as we know earth observation lacks many times in situ data which is the training data for the satellite um, in that respect there is massive potential to collect more of that in situ data which is on the ground data measurements can be done by citizens potentially. But also the sensors, the sensors can be read, they can be collected, they can be placed by citizens. Um, and there is this example from Antwerp, which we've heard in the previous um, example and presentation. And there is, of course, also the whole Internet of Things, and there is a lot of data flowing, and many times the data needs to be curated, the data needs to be categorized, and there is also big scope for citizen science to work in that arena as well. And with that, I hand over to my colleague, Dilek. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, Stefan um, um, just gave us an overview about non-traditional data approaches and where we place citizen science um, in this data ecosystem. And now I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to pass these slides quickly because we all we are all experts about um, UN Sustainable Development Goals and also Data Revolution for Sustainable Development. And um, I'm just going to talk about uh, our workshop at IASA. Um, we, the citizen science community, argue that uh, citizen-generated data or citizen science as part of it has a great potential in tracking um, sustainable development goals. It can complement the official data sources, which is very important. We don't say that it replaces the official data sources. We just say that it complements, uh, it can complement official data sources and fill data gaps. And uh, to prove this point, uh, about three weeks ago, in the beginning of October, um, we, the citizen science community, including experts from um, citizen science associations worldwide, citizen science practitioners, experts, um, academics that are working in the field, as well as national statistical offices and UN uh, representatives gathered at IASA in Austria 
to discuss the contribution citizen science can make to the uh, SDG monitoring process. And we also address the question, how can we improve the understanding and acceptability of citizen science by national statistical offices, UN custodian agencies, and other policymakers? Um, what, what came out of this discussion was um, uh, about uh, the topics on citizen science in general. First of all, we try to define what citizen science and what citizen-generated data is. So um, I'm just going to quickly touch on that. Um, the way we describe citizen science is the involvement of citizens in scientific activities. In other words, uh, inclusive generation of knowledge. And citizen-generated data is very um, broad um, a part, basically it, the data produced by citizens. And citizen science uh, is a part of citizen-generated data. Uh, but what we mean by that, um, what would be a citizen science initiative um, that can help the SDG progress? I'm going to give an example about uh, one of our own projects at the Center for Earth Observation and Citizen Science of Yaza that is called PhotoQuest Go. Um, PhotoQuest Go is a good example uh, on this. So that's why I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Our motivation with the PhotoQuest Go project is to improve the quality of Earth observation-based uh, land use and land cover products and maps, uncover the potential of citizen science and Earth observation to improve the way we understand the world, and the lower, uh, lowering the cost of in-situ data collection methods. Um, the, the aims of the PhotoQuest Go is to complement data gathered through the um, EU Land Use and Coverage Area Framework survey that is called LUCAS in short. Um, these data are expensive to gather and, um, and it only takes place in every three years, which is quite a bit of long time in terms of um, land use and cover monitoring. And PhotoQuest Go is also about um, investigating whether citizens can uh, produce good quality results um, 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 good quality data compared to the Lucas experts. Um, the way it works, I'm just going to quickly describe how it works. The app, there's a there's an app, PhotoQuest Go app. So this app navigates the users to the, to the points uh, that are the same as Lucas points, Lucas uh, where the experts are visiting. And uh, when they are at the point, uh, the citizens are taking pictures from four cardinal directions and on the ground and answer a few questions about uh, land use and land cover of the point, and then submit their uh, results uh, for quality assurance. This is a very important part of this um, because we developed a feedback tool for data quality assurance that helps us make real time, real time or near, yeah, we could say near real time um, comparisons between the data collected by the citizens and by the Lucas experts. Our latest PhotoCoSkill campaign uh, was launched in, on uh, 8th of June, and it lasted about uh, 11 weeks. Uh, it just ended uh, in the beginning of October. Um, just to have a look at the numbers very quickly, um, this was in, the, in Europe, the, the campaign. We had more than 140 contributors. This is not much, but there's a lot to do in terms of the outreach activities. We know that, but just, just to give an overview. And uh, we collected about, though, 1,680 plus quests. And this is very important. 98% of these quests were um, good quality. They were accepted uh, through our um, experts. And 46% um, of which were in perfect quality, which are either the same as the Lucas experts quality or even better than that. Um, we collected about 7, 000, uh, more than 7,000 uh, photos. And uh, here you see the results of the survey from the 2017 campaign, not the latest campaign, because uh, we haven't done the analysis yet for the latest campaign. Um, you can see the motivations of citizens in participating uh, this project. Most of them were interested in contributing to, the, to, to science, and then they have strong interest in the project or enjoy being outdoors. There are different motivations of people that are participating in citizen science projects and activities. Um, but as this example shows, um, citizen science has clearly a lot to offer in terms of um, SDG monitoring process. PhotoQuest Go, for instance, can help um, or would be a great value of uh, SDG 15, um, life on land. And this is only one example out of many. 
and um, how citizen science uh, projects or initiatives are contributing to the SDG progress. And uh, more examples will follow after me. Libby is going to talk about them a bit more. Um, well, we can say, or this indicates that citizen science can help leverage the SDG efforts uh, with the application of new methodologies to enhance the quality of such data. And I just talked about our uh, new real-time feedback tool that we are uh, offering for quality checks. And citizen science, even though we're at the uh, data forum, has also, um, uh, can also support SDG implementation through transformative processes. So we're not only looking at the data and how data can help uh, the transformative processes, but we're also talking about the learning outcomes of citizen science in citizens. Um, citizen science, um, like for instance, co-design of the research questions and research methodology, contribution to the data collection activities, as well as interpreting the findings are uh, the activities citizens uh, can join. And there are examples for them. And um, this can broaden the scientific knowledge generation and science being adapted to the needs of the society, and which could enhance the social interactions also between science, policy, and citizens. Um, this can also produce a better understanding of the scientific content and raise the awareness, especially on the environmental issues. That is the key for implementation of the SDGs, as well as many others. But just to quickly touch base on the opportunities citizen science can offer for the SDG processes. For, first of all, we already mentioned that um, citizen science or citizen-generated data is part of it can complement official sources of data and fill data gaps that exist in a timely way, and they can also supplement the um, official reporting. They can contribute to the achievement of SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals, because we just talked about uh, the partnership between science, um, policy, and citizens. Citizen-generated data is also cost-effective. For instance, in the case of PhotoQuest Go, you can imagine um, for the 2015 survey, the European Union sent out 750 experts to the whole of the European Union to collect data on land use and land cover. And the number of points were about 270,000. So this, we're talking about huge numbers here versus citizen scientists can contribute with very little or zero. Citizen science um, has also the potential to strengthen accountability. It can help ensure that the official data aligns with the reality within a society. And um, it can offer a control mechanism to assure the credibility of SDG processes. Finally, citizen science has also um, can contribute to the uh, transformation towards sustainability, as I mentioned before. What about the challenges? Um, and uh, our solutions that we are suggesting for, for these challenges. So um, geographical and um, thematic coverage of citizen science initiatives can be, can be a challenge. Um, but because citizen science initiatives usually tend to be um, uh, for a limited um, location or particular location and theme. Um, however, there are examples of successful expansion, like Martin was um, uh, suggesting about the global mosquito alert uh, in the previous session. And uh, also, PhotoQuest Go was being adapted or was being scaled up to Europe uh, from Austria, because the first three campaigns we had within PhotoQuest Go was only for um, Austria, versus the last one scaled up to Europe. And also the thematic coverage. Um, for instance, other uh, citizen science initiative that we have at the Center for Earth Observation and Citizen Science of Yaza is PictorePile that initially was created to uh, measure the extent of def deforestation was scaled up to uh, post-disaster uh, damage mapping. And data quality and reliability is another challenge that my uh, colleagues also touched upon. But at the, uh, because at the moment there's lack of standards of citizen-generated data, uh, collection and use. But the colleagues from um, uh, national and European or the worldwide citizen science associations are gathering to address this issue and develop the standards uh, for uh, public participation in research that will come out, Libby said, um, June next year, hopefully. January, sorry. <laughs> Adoption, adoption of these standards um, improve, uh, can improve the data quality by making them more consistent and relevant and available for broader applications. 
And um, there are also other ways to improve the quality of citizen-generated data by while designing the citizen science initiatives, like we did with the Photographs Go project. When, the, when we launched the first campaign, we didn't have the feedback tool. But uh, later on, we, we, see, we saw the importance of having this feedback tool to give immediate feedback to the, to the users so that they can improve the quality of their results later on. Um, about the data privacy, Stefan also um, talked about that, but this is also a, uh, an issue within the citizen science projects. But what we can afford, uh, offer for that is the anonymizing uh, the data sets. So removing all the personal information from the data. And finally, the reluctance on its use for policy making, but which is exactly why we are here. We would like to change that. We would like to see citizen science um, in all the UN reports as a, as a method, as a new data, uh, big data method that is offered to collect uh, information um, on the issues that are surrounding us. And finally, the way forward for citizen science would be, um, we would like to build more partnerships with official data producers, such as national statistical offices. And um, we are already in process of liaising with the UN custodian agencies, which started with UNEP, for input in developing methodologies, especially for tier three indicators, where there is um, uh, no um, standards available or no methodology available. And uh, we, we are also, um, we, we, we would also like to evaluate where actively sit generated citizen science or data uh, may contribute most to the SDGs in order to increase the uh, acceptability of citizen science projects um, by the policymakers and UN agencies, etc. With that, um, we will we will go with Libby now, and she will give us some examples about uh, particular examples about citizen science projects that are already making progress. But I think Stefan would like to say a few words. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've, um, I've been asked just to talk about one or two uh, examples of projects which contribute, um, which are contributing to the sustainable development goals, or which could in, in such significant fashion. So um, this, this is what Alex Caldas, who's the Director of Country Outreach of UNEP, has said about it, um, and we agree with him entirely. But uh, when we look at it, what is citizen, citizen science doing that can really make a difference, can really make a big contribution to the SDGs? Well, I'd like to take you to the country that I live, which is Australia. And you all know of the Great Barrier Reef, I think. Um, and there are just one or, two, um, uh, one or two examples down here at the bottom of exactly how big it is. It's 2,300 kilometers long. So we're talking about a huge uh, ecosystem here. Um, so it's an amazing um, kind of thing to try and manage. And there are, there's a lot of satellite data that is being used in the management these days. And because satellite data is getting better, then they can see more and more in terms of what's there. So you could see coral bleaching here fairly evidently on the bottom. So satellite data is being used, um, but for something like the Great Barrier Reef, you actually need feet on the ground or fins in the water or, or whatever, however you would like to call it. To be able to see what's going on in detail, you need to get people there. You need to get people actually looking at the Great Barrier Reef. And there are a number of citizen science projects that do this. There's a thing called the um, Great Barrier Reef Alliance, which is a, an alliance of projects in, in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, 13 different organizations have come together. You can see the, uh, the logos of them at the bottom. Um, and in 2017, members of the group collected a million plus data points on the reef. And what they're saying is, and what they're doing is connecting and amplifying through citizen science, um, it helps in terms of the management of the reef and understanding what's going on there. And this is one particular project, and it's a fairly recent project that started. It's called the Virtual Reef Diver. Um, it's uh, by Queensland University. Um, it's been done, it was our national project for National Science Week this week, so it was on the Australian Broadcasting 
um, corporation. It was is put out as as a that suggested that people get involved. And uh, already, well, when Martin and I were up in Queensland, they got over 1.2 million uh, records that had been analysed. But this is a, a very scientific, very technologically advanced project that's that's being done, and it's all online. So this isn't getting your feet wet, but it's citizen science involved in looking at the reef and seeing what's there. Um, on the left, you can see the process of, of how it works. Um, on the right here, you can see what you actually do. You, it's a Zooniverse project, and um, I was encouraged to uh, encourage all of you to go and have a look at it and get involved with it and try it, because it's a model that can be replicated, and I know that some of you in the United Arab Emirates would, might be interested in this, so something that can be done. Um, what's happening is that the, the they're using at the moment photographs that are taken by uh, divers that are down there, um, and um, I'm putting them in touch with with an organisation that's got uh, 50 years worth of um, the best underwater photography on the reef from people who made films with David Attenborough, Jacques Cousteau, and other people that you might have heard of. So we're going to go back in history and get people to to actually look and and to help them with this work to do this. So. It's totally online, but the, the possibility of this is that people everywhere in the globe, and I think that the Great Barrier Reef is one of those places, is one of those iconic places that belongs to the world and that people feel as if it's one of the, the most important uh, wildlife places in the world so that everybody can get involved with it. So it's a really interesting project from that point of view. So those different sorts of citizen science projects that come together to contribute to build up the picture. So it's citizens working in different ways with scientists, with resource managers to make things better, to do the best they can. And this is a completely different project that I wanted to show you. Um, this is one of the members of our um, SDG and citizen science working group. And I didn't know about this uh, project until a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's uh, Dr. Jessica Wardlaw from Nottingham University that's doing this. It's a uh, um, and I had no idea of the numbers. I didn't know anything about this, and I had no idea that you might be able to do something with it in terms of citizen science. But they have a slavery observatory um, where they compile, synthesize, and integrate spatial data to detect and, and prevent slavery. And they've developed automated methods for this as much as possible. Um, and again, it's 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 been it's being done at the university, and it's been done with a very high high degree of scientific accuracy. Um, um, and they've identified different sorts of uh, places in the world, different sorts of slavery that's going on that you can actually see from space. And this is what's happening, and this is where the citizen science gets involved with it. They first of all do this statistical inferences via random sampling uh, through the satellite imagery. But step two is the important bit, and it's testing the re reliability of the, the visual interpretation by citizen science. And it's not just one person saying that they can see it. Normally, if, if we're using ground truthing of satellite data, um, people replicate it, and it's not unless you get uh, four or five different people saying the same thing. That's what happens in Zooniverse with the with the constellations, with the different star formations. It's only when you get a certain number of, of agreed um, identifications that, that it's taken on board as, as being real. But what you can see these days from space, because the satellite data is so amazing, um, you can actually see these are brick kilns. So you can see they're quite an, uh, an obvious kind of shape that you can see from space. So this is one of the things that, that, that you can actually, where you can get people to look at these, look at the images and, and, and say, yes, this is one, and this is a brick kiln. You can see the bricks on the ground. You can see the, the shape of the kiln, which is pretty, uh, pretty evident there. And these are the kind of things that they're doing. So they're developing methods so people can help them with this most important, most uh, it's a, it's a problem we shouldn't have in this day and age, um, but in terms of the goal, global goals, this is a global goal target 8.7, and they're actually doing this this work to to feed directly into this goal, and it's not just in one place; it's for the whole world. 
And again, I'll go back to this one. Um, Rosie's talked about this already, but it is a very good one for a number of reasons. Um, because the Tangaroa Blue has been going for a long time, um, I think for, since 2004. Um, and they, what they've done is they've now developed a, a whole network of people who are doing the same things. They've refined their methodologies. Um, so there are different, different kinds of methodologies that they use, um, but the ways they do the data collection have been, um, have been harmonized so that they're all the same and they keep doing it. And it's, uh, it's a very, very good way of doing it provides a database that, that's multifaceted. It's got lots of information on there. And as Rosie said, these are some of the numbers that they've got um, till now, 2004 to 2018. So we're talking about a long time series data set here um, that's verified and, and uh, is really good. And the, the, out of this, the actions, they've got 250 source reduction plans that have already been implemented. So it's not just going and collecting waste. And this is a bit of a complicated slide for which I apologize, but it just gives you some idea of um, the kind of database that they, they've created and the kind of numbers that they're talking about now. I think um, 12 million something or other uh, items have been removed. But it's, they don't, haven't just taken it away. They've actually categorized it. So they've got 55 different categories uh, of waste, of, of, of pollute, marine pollution, and 27 categories of plastic. So uh, everything from bits of uh, fishing net down to plastic bottles to everything else you can think of. So that's on the database. So it's a really complex and really comprehensive database. Um, and as they said here, some of the long-term data sets have been done monthly. So it's not just a snapshot view. This is over time and in, in great depth and complexity. And they've got proven methodologies, accurate, accurate and extensive database, readily scalable globally. And it's already contributing to Australian official reporting against the SDGs. It goes into our official statistics. So um, it, that's one that we're really proud of because it is actually already being used towards the SDGs. And I go back to Rosie's slide, which shows exactly where it goes and, and what contribution is being made. And this, this methodology, and, and this it's been so well proved for so long, it's already being taken uh, to other countries in the Pacific. I think they were at a workshop in Fiji last week. Um, they're very happy for this to be taken globally. But again, we come back to the issues that, that Martin was talking about. Um, scalability is an issue. Even when you've got the methodology, you've got it proven, you know that it works, you know people like doing it, they like getting involved with it, they will help you, but how do you do it? And that's why we need some kind of a framework that we can work together to make these things happen, to take the best of what, what there is for citizen science and to expand it, to take it out further. So we get a better picture, we get action on the ground, and we get the community involved in, in everything that, that needs to be done. Thank you. And what I want to try and finish with today is some of the outputs from the uh, IASA workshop of what we would like to see as a community come from the Dubai uh, World Data Forum. Because at this point in time, all the good things you're seeing on citizen science um, do not yet contribute to the formal reporting mechanisms for the SDGs. So we, we want to make a series of recommendations and observations to the World Data Forum and to the chair of the World Data Forum on what we would like to see change to allow citizen science data to become an integral part of the SDG reporting. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the only way this will happen is if the UN requires an institutional framework to encourage the uptake and implementation of citizen science across its activities. Because if you talk to the national statistics offices, you will get the same reaction globally. Um, the data is not reliable. It's not scalable. It's not done over a long enough time period. 
it doesn't fit in with the, the national reporting methodologies. Um, it's a different way of gathering data. It's an unconventional data source. All of these issues are highlighted. So um, the, a, a book has just been produced on citizen science. Um, it's free, open access, uh, University College London. You can download all the chapters and use the information in it. So it's all open access. We're true to our word in terms of the way we're delivering it. If you want a hard copy, you pay for the hard copy. Uh, but electronically, you can see the whole document. Chapter 16 explores citizen science for policy formulation and implementation. Um, and it's brought together a whole string of experts who tackled these sorts of issues on how you bring citizen science into policy making decisions. And what you'll find in the book, and I'm just pulling out some of the key messages here, is that the challenges for citizen science based policy are initially around connecting to current policy priorities, getting a high level commitment from the organizations you're with to engage with citizen science. And I'll show you an example later on where high level commitment means President Obama from the United States, um, who got involved personally in driving citizen science into the American psyche. So we're talking at government level, really senior people who can see the value of citizens engaging with government. You then need a clear policy strategy for citizen science initiatives to help ensure they're perceived as useful for policy. Uh, not as one European bureaucrat said to me, this is hobbying. It's of no relevance to the policy framework. This is people doing what they like. It isn't delivering anything in terms of policy gain. So it has to benefit as well from guidance from the policymaker on what they will find helpful from the citizens. And Libby talked about the sweet spots, and they are the areas where top down it provides value to policy, and bottom up it affects people's lives. And I cannot think of a better example. Um, where that is true than in air quality. Right across the globe, um, 400,000 people in Europe die early as a result of air quality problems. So understanding the air quality issue in cities is massive. It's a big policy objective. It's a big personal objective to people. So that's why in the examples you heard from Belgium, the, the uptake from citizens is massive. It's almost more than they can cope with. If you can imagine 50,000 people getting involved in air quality monitoring, 5% of the population, and multiply that up across the major cities of the world, you get some idea of how powerful this could be if we can roll it out as global programs. Integrating citizen science data is absolutely crucial. It is no good using different techniques in different parts of the globe with different databases and different standards if you want to influence the SDGs at UNEP level. You have got to cooperate. You have got to make sacrifices in the way you adopt the programs so you do the same thing together or similar things together. Developing citizen engagement and empowerment is difficult for public officials. These are skills that many of them don't normally have. So you need to recognize that in looking for citizen science to work into policy. There needs to be coordination across organizational governance areas. The best programs have pulled together across the silos of government to get citizen science working in all of them. And the US example, I think, is very powerful because the last thing they looked at was biodiversity. We all know citizens are involved in biodiversity, but they looked at health. They looked at emergency response. They looked at things that you would not think of where citizen science would be involved, where it was bringing massive financial advantage. You also need to support pilots and have practical experimentation 
within the different policy areas of government to work out what works best in different cultures, in different countries around the world. And you need to establish and strengthen communities of practice in public administrations. There will always be beacons of change civil servants who want to adopt citizen science. But they will meet incredible obstacles from others and their other colleagues within the same organizations. So building communities of practice helps to drive the whole process of citizen science across the organization, especially when you've got senior level uh, support for what you're doing. You've heard the challenges, you've all heard of the data quality and management. Let me just push this to one side. I'm not diminishing it, but data quality in citizen science is no different to data quality in traditional science. You can have good citizen science with good quality data. You can have poor citizen science with poor citizen science data. But that's true of traditional science as well, as you heard from Stefan. There are now models to show people how to adopt citizen science into public institutions. The US model is enshrined in law. The Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act of 2017 removes any legal impediment to federal agencies involved in citizen science. But they actually went further. As part of the Obama administration proposals, there was a requirement on each of the federal agencies to explore what was happening in their respective business areas with citizen science, and then to come back with a plan to show what they were going to do to enhance value as part of their day job. So not a project, but something, a way of enhancing the way you do your work. The European model has brought together the Environment Knowledge Community and Citizen Science Group, again, to share experiences. Again, in the EU, if you go back four years, citizen science was mentioned once in all the legislation in the EU. And that was in the seventh action framework, the sort of five-year forward look. And all it said was there is an opportunity for citizen science to contribute to the data to show us how effective we are in delivering our legal obligations. The knowledge community has then looked at what the opportunities are right across the business and made recommendations to their senior management, which has now been endorsed, and they have a five-year program in place. Part of the output of that now is a three million euro program to the European Citizen Science Association to coordinate citizen science across Europe, to move away from what another official told me citizen science was, which was a fireworks display. Lots of nice ideas, the firework goes off, the rocket fires, it looks great for three months, then it's gone. That is not useful to policy. It has to run like uh, Libby was showing you on water quality sampling over a long time period. And then you have the models in Germany, Austria, Scotland, Ireland, and also Finland, where national programs have been put in place and they're moving in the same direction in some of the states in Australia, where you map out what citizen science can actually do to help in terms of a whole series of policy areas for your particular bit of government business. You have to deal with things like inequality and power imbalances. So the marginalized communities that normally would not get involved or are difficult to involve, if you, do, if you really want good data sets, you involve them. Because very often it's the marginalized communities that live and work in areas experiencing environmental problems. So they are the very best to be involved in understanding what the scale of the problem is, where they live. And they are the people who can help you put the monitoring equipment in place and have some chance that it will be there on Tuesday after you put it in on Monday. If you come into those communities and try and impose it from outside, you'll probably find the monitoring station has long since gone. There's a recognition of top down, bottom up. I've covered that, the sweet spots, things that matter to people. Don't try and impose citizen science projects on people that you're interested in that they're not. It won't work. Although there are some lovely exceptions to that. I heard one in Australia where the driest of citizen science projects was digitizing historical records from the Geological Institute. 
they predicted it would take them four years to digitize the records. They did it in four months. And they could not believe there were people out there that was actually interested in doing this. But there were. Citizen science is also a contested space. Don't expect the citizen to be malleable and do what you want. You have to have a dialogue. And the citizen will come with their own ideas. And very often they're experts in the areas that you're engaging them with. You have to be prepared to listen and change some of the ideas that you've got from the top down and let them contest the space with you. You also need to recognize that many of them will be transdisciplinary. They'll cut across issues. You may be interested in the environmental issue. They may, may be interested in the health issue. And they will automatically cut across. And you need to have the flexibility to enable you to move in that direction. There's also some lovely work that goes on with do-it-yourself trends, hackathons, as they're called. For those of you who followed the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it was a hackathon that identified the technology for citizen science to use to take aerial photographs of the extent of the oil spills that were all used in the litigation against BP because the American government had a no-fly zone over the area for obvious reasons. Without the hackathon, without the technology that came from that, that data would never have been acquired. Okay, now we have drones, but they didn't in those days. You've seen this slide before. This is what I would call a center of excellence in the UN for citizen science. This is a part of the organization that is promoting citizen science. I can go back into the EU five years ago and find three or four points very similar to that. But the institution did not have a framework in place to support citizen science. And my projection is that neither does the UN. The UN has areas of excellence, but it hasn't got the overall institutional framework yet for citizen science, and you see that here. Because when you look at the UN World Data Forum, it has not yet accepted that it needs a framework for citizen science. So my ask is here, we're working on it. I'm hoping that we come out from this session and from the work we did at Vienna with a statement on what we, the citizen science community, want to see in the UN World Data Forum to recognize uh, the citizen science global partnership to start with and to note that we've already put in place, as a result of UNEA 3, a whole string of actions in less than 12 months. The acting global secretariat, the resources to work with UNEP and the science policy business forum, Resources to input to UNEA 4 next year, which will be held in Nairobi in March. And looking forward, in two years' time, the next World Data Forum, where I hope we're an integral part of the main program rather than the Eye on Earth program, although we still will support the Eye on Earth program. We now have a global website where information on practice for citizen science can be accessed a new open transdisciplinary citizen science database developing, and the SDG working group. We've also got an acting business advisory group, which is really important, because we as a community have to come to grips with the funding business models for global citizen science programs. And we won't do that without business and commercial interests. We cannot just be dependent on public funding. And we need to carry on encouraging citizen science to grow in the globe to show that it's more significant each year. And for us, that means encouraging the new associations in Africa and Asia, and even newer ones, maybe in the Middle East, here, in South America, in the West Indies, and Central America. So we also want to ask the New World Data Forum to recognize that citizen science through the SDG Working Group, can help the custodians, the IAEG SDG designated custodians, to come up with the methods that will deliver the SDGs, particularly the Tier 3 methods, where we can deliver new ideas and new thinking on how you deliver um, some of the data gaps that are missing. And that we can then help to fill those data gaps 
with the activities of citizen scientists. And the water quality one is beautifully linked with remote sensing data, which is currently excluded from the methodologies um, and the SDG method systems with the custodians. So we need to challenge some of the tier two areas as well as tier three. But let's run before we can walk and start with the tier three ones. So we want to call on the UN World Data Forum to recognize that citizen science continues its spectacular growth. And people go on at me for using words like that, but I cannot believe in four years how fast this movement is moving. It's almost too fast for the people who are involved in it. And the scale of it is, it just keeps growing. We want them to recognize that legal frameworks are emerging to support citizen science with supporting legislation, such as the Act in the USA. The government agencies are getting more supportive and putting in citizen science strategies. And I love the quote from the New South Wales government that we're heralding a new era of public, public participation in science by developing collaborative projects that support decision making and are engaging the public. And I wish I'd dreamt that one up. It's a really nice statement. So we're calling on the UN World Data Forum to recognize that citizen science is now augmenting and enhancing traditional scientific research and monitoring, and that it is already delivering quality data sets that must be part of the SDG reporting process. That there are opportunities to utilize citizen science to improve official statistics including through using citizen science to fill the gaps or validate existing data and to use citizen science in the compilation of official statistics. And although you see the examples of the lack of data from Africa, I can also take you back into the United Kingdom and I can show you a lack of data in the United Kingdom, particularly on topic areas that the government doesn't particularly want large quantities of data on. And a good example is air quality in the urban areas. So we need to fill data gaps at home as well as abroad. And I think this is one of the great strengths of the citizen science movement is that citizen science can deliver a level of spatial, what I call spatial granularity, density of surveys. That's often just not possible with conventional research and monitoring. And on the Mosquito Alert program, there are places the citizens go official monitors would never ever go to, where they can record what is actually happening on the ground. And they're the people affected, and they will want to take part. It's cost effective. This is not to say it replaces formal systems. It enhances formal systems. It's not an either or, it's a both. And that the time has arrived for the IEA, IAEG SDG custodians to work with the global citizen science community to formally integrate citizen science into the adopted reporting standards for the SDGs. And yes, we can start with the tier three, but we need to be part of the formal process. So in summary, effectively, we're calling on the UN Statistical Commission to put in place an institutional framework to enable the global citizen science community to identify mechanisms for bringing citizen science into the scope of official statistics. That's across the globe. That's not in just in isolated pockets. This would open up a process by which the global citizen science community could work with the SDG custodian agencies and the members of the interagency and expert group of the SDG indicator outputs to develop, test and implement citizen science methodologies as an integral part of SDG reporting. And to finish with is this bold statement that the Citizen Science Global Partnership calls on the UN World Data Forum participants to formally recognize citizen science as a major new unconventional data source. At that point, I will finish and apologies that they are heavy word slides but we're trying to get some heavy messages across with these. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, we've heard a lot of information, but I think the audience didn't yet have the time to ask some questions. So at that point, if you still have some energy, I hope you still have some energy, we can um, have some questions. Um, so please, please do not hesitate if you... Any, any questions? Any question? Hello, this is Halisa from UNESCO. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, I completely agree, citizen science is key uh, to monitor the SDGs, but as well to be part of the uh, uh, sustainable solutions uh, for the countries. Um, uh, in the challenges you, Martin, that you put in your presentation, I guess there is one which is <laughs> missing, and um, it's uh, the, the 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 scientists, I mean, or experts uh, who uh, studied and uh, did, you know, have a background on research and. Um, sometimes maybe they, are, they can be reluctant to uh, citizen science because they would be afraid that their, uh, their work uh, is taken or... So uh, can you please explain how, uh, and in this sense, I guess, collabor collaborating as well, not uh, only with the UN system, uh, but as well with the scientific community would be key here uh, to, to have uh, uh, a complete support for citizen science. I don't know if I was clear, but... No, you're very, you're very clear, and, and, and I, I understand fully that the question from the academic point of view. Um, the, the riposte to it, I think, is to say, who wouldn't want 50,000 people to support their research? It's an absolute bonus to them. Uh, the problem, I think, is it's asking them to do research in a different way, with different skill sets, and they haven't done it that way, many of them, for years. The, the other issue is that the academic institutions, again, I talked about the UN um, framework for supporting citizen science. Many of the academic institutions don't have a framework to support academics who get involved in citizen science. But having said all of that, if you look at the literature and you do a search on the word citizen science, the number of papers on citizen science is now going through the roof. So I think attitudes will change over time, but there does need to be work with the academic institutions to get better recognition for those scientists who are in the academic institutions who get involved in citizen science. Because it's not the traditional way of doing it, but by, by golly, it's a better way of doing it. There was, there was another question. I might just add one more thing to this. So I think you made a good point about the scientists being afraid. But there's the other point that some of the traditional statistical people having worked in this field for a long time, they see this threat coming from these non-traditional approaches. And I've experienced that also with respect to remote sensing. That has also already happened. And of course, that's something which we will all need to deal with and with which the statistical traditional offices will have to, to some degree, deal with that. You know, there are new approaches which are sometimes better in delivering some data. And governments need to also be prepared to, to deal with that, those new non-traditional approaches. And there is some threat, of course, which, which this people feel, and, and that's also understandable, but it has to be somehow dealt with. Let me, let me just add one other, one other thought, and, and that is that uh, the, the US case, that the people will argue about how much President Obama got involved in the process, but he endorsed it, and his staff endorsed it. Uh, the European Citizen Science Association was launched by the Environment Commissioner, Janusz Potocznik, who saw the political advantage in linking citizens to the policy process and by the director of the European Environment Agency. That's what I call commitment at the top level. It was as a result of Janusz Potocznik's 
uh, involvement in the launch of the European Citizen Science Association, that we began a dialogue uh, with the middle-ranking uh, civil servants within the EU. And I can still remember the first day I went in to talk to them. And broadly the answer that I got was, why would I be interested in citizen science? It doesn't cover the policy areas I'm interested in. It doesn't provide the scale of data I want. It doesn't provide it over a long enough time period. The data isn't accurate. Now tell me why I'm wrong or go away. And we went on from that point to, by the time that that individual actually retired, and retired about 12 months ago, he said, I was wrong, Martin. Um, there is a real role for citizen science in policy making at the European Union. And what you're now seeing, 2017 for me, was a breakthrough year with the European Union. We're seeing the same process with the UN. We're seeing individuals understanding the potential, but it hasn't yet got that top level endorsement that I think it still needs, and I hope we will see that in the next two to three years. That means the Secretary General of the UN getting interested in citizen science. Thank you very much. My name is Alena Bartonjova. I work for Norwegian Institute for Air Research. And um, we have been kind of involved in, in um, uh, perhaps not exactly citizen science, but certainly using citizen contributed data, which I would like to make this distinction because I think it's important. Um, and I'm, I must say my colleagues and I, we find it very exciting. We have been for many years uh, wanting to do research that would allow us uh, really make a proper spatial, very detailed spatial maps, not only spatial, but also in time. Uh, there has been many attempts. It kind of, in the end, is is not generally so, so easy because of the funds that you need and the input data that you need. And by, we have been now for four years developing methods how to integrate the citizen contributed data into the other uh, observations and models through procedures and we are now able to do that and we wouldn't have been able to do that without uh, let's say the pro technology that has developed since last five ten years maybe five years three years two years one year it goes very quickly we uh, we would not have been able to we, we were able to actually study the properties of the data we have tried to um, develop ways how to how to get data not only on physical entities but also on people's perception because we believe that's really important and I would be extremely happy if anybody would take that perception thing on. <laughs> so I'll come talk to you. So I think there is really not much to ask because I think Martin, you said it all and it, it reflects our view. Politicians are often asking about pedigree of the information uh, I think that today, if you recall what Libby was saying about the, the methods and the, the kind of uh, scientific uh, acceptability or accept or accountability of the methods, uh, that's really important. That's the distinction between the citizen contributed and citizen science, really, but never mind that. So I think it's coming together, and I am, I'm really happy about the development, and I hope it will continue. And these this two sessions, uh, I didn't expect them. And I'm extremely happy I could be here, and I would like to thank you for that. I mean, it, was it a question, or was it a comment? Comment, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was more of a comment. Uh, it, it's, a very nice, it, it's a very nice comment, but, but what, what I think I, I would like to say on the air quality is, be, before I came in here, I had a conversation with the WHO. And the WHO were telling me there is still resistance to citizen data on air quality. There is still resistance to using very simple techniques for monitoring air quality. Uh, I'm an ex-oil man. The simple techniques were actually invented by BP, who I worked for 25 to 30 years ago. So I know the techniques work. I know that they calibrate against more sophisticated mm -hmm. equipment. We just have to have confidence and faith in what we're doing and drive these things through. Because we've already seen six form scientists take these techniques and apply them in Kazakhstan. They've, they've got communities together to buy the monitoring equipment and to pay for the analysis. Because if you, if you, if you put in place simple techniques that people can use, they will adopt them 
and they will invent commercial business models to make it work. And the, the, the thing I found so exciting about what they were doing in Belgium is those 20,000 people who came forward were going to pay to get involved because they could see this was something that affected their health. And I think once you get to that point, one of the fears that some of the regulators have is this is not controllable. Um, that actually you get a commercial business model starting to form and people will pick up and use the techniques in the most unexpected of places. And I vividly remember recently watching a, a program about Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, which has a desperate air quality problem in the city and the people there have no idea how to monitor it and understand what the risks are. And the reporter going in took the monitoring equipment with them. As soon as they understood the risks, they moved their children out of the capital to the, back to the rural areas, and their health dramatically improved. So if you give people knowledge, they will use it to manage risk, and I think that's really important. Then there is a bigger question. Will they use it to talk to their rulers to drive change in their society? And I'm not trying to pretend that's an easy one. It's not. It's not easy in the UK even. But I think giving them the knowledge to manage the risk is the first step. And by involving them in, in the programmes, you see behaviour change starting to happen. You also see them beginning to recognise they might just be part of the problem that's causing the air quality in the first place. And I know that that's one of the ambitions of one of the cities uh, in the world where the UN are involved to try to help people to understand the impact of black carbon from, from burning open fires, for instance, as part of your heating systems. So they're part of the problem, they understand the problem and become part of the solution. Okay, uh, thanks Martin for that. Um, other questions? Yes, there is a question here in the back. Yeah, my, my name is Dennis Moniki, I work at UN Habitat, I'm working on SDG 11. Uh, the truth is, as the presenter was saying, that uh, there's a lot of challenges with the quality of, or the acceptability of citizen-generated citizen data in official statistics. And this is also the challenge that you're facing with the uh, SDG 11, despite the fact that uh, such information can be used to, uh, but to do a lot of disaggregation for some of the indicators. The question, uh, the question I want to put across, or maybe a comment, is even as we push to have uh, the national statistical offices adopt the citizen science approach to data, we also need maybe to propose approaches on how to validate the information, because this is a real fear. It is very subjective, especially when, when you look at the context of resources. Resources in most countries get allocated based based on the maybe quality or the, the quality of services that are available for a community. So so maybe it's a good idea to as you propose to the UN structure or system to adopt citizen science, then also propose approaches on how to validate some of the data. I think that would to kind of also seal some of the loopholes. Yes, maybe I can say something about that on the on the validation. I think validation is very important in all aspects. So it can be a two-way validation. So on the one hand, citizens can validate also to some degree official statistics. You know, is it really right or is there maybe some problem somewhere in the country? And that information can come from citizens. And it can also be the other way around. So citizens can produce data and I think it's completely valid and there needs to be this complementarity that the official statistics then can also say maybe at that location there was an issue with with the citizens collected data. So I think it's a two-way learning approach and I think the important thing is the complementarity of the two and that nobody feels threatened by the other and, and that you can increase the overall quality of the data and hence the overall quality of life in the country by this partnership between the two. Um, any, any other, uh, maybe somebody else wants to comment on this? I just would like to add to that, like um, it's a very important point, but we have also issues about um, data quality around other uh, traditional data sources as well that are being used at the moment. We're not saying that yesterday I participated in a session um, Danny from uh, Open Knowledge Institution was saying about the citizen-generated data when he was presenting. He was saying that um, there is no superior data approach. So all of them have their advantages and disadvantages and opportunities and challenges. The idea is to use them together to complement each other. 
we're not suggesting that citizen science should be the only method or only non-traditional data approach that should be used in this process. We're just suggesting that it could complement the, tra complement the traditional sources, uh, traditional approaches together with other non-traditional approaches as well. Thank you. Thanks. There's another question here or um, comment. Sorry, I'm excited by this subject. <laughs> this is my second question. Well, that's great. You're still excited <laughs> at that time in this afternoon. <laughs> um, uh, my other uh, comment, maybe not question, but uh, is um, I asked the IPCC uh, team uh, if they are using uh, citizen science for their reports. And they said, they said, no, they cannot uh, use uh, the data uh, produced di directly produced by citizens, uh, citizens, but they do, uh, if it is published in the scientific literature, they do. So it, it means through the scientific community. So th actually, th they do use, even if they don't say it like that, but when the scientific community uh, uses this uh, citizen, citizen science data, it is included in the report. But it's true that it's not uh, mentioned, it's not recognized as a contribution from citizens. But actually, it does in some very important global assessments. Yes, so yes th thanks a lot for that point. Yes, I mean, it's not a surprise that they use the published literature because the IPCC is a kind of um, way of looking at all the existing literature and it's an assessment of what has been published until now, summarizing and making it concise. So that's why this is. But this would be a plea also for citizen science data to be published. And there are a lot of examples where um, citizen science data has been used for very high level publications and I think much more can be done on that front as well. Um, there is another another question. There's, there's, there's one other thing and, and, and that is attribution back to the citizen. Um, we've, I've talked to, to, to various um, citizen science programs and they cannot believe the goodwill that that creates even if, even if it's just inviting the citizens to come into the scientific institution to meet the scientists who are running the programme, citizens really enjoy seeing attribution for their contributions. And if they identify something that's new to science, uh, the Zooniverse actually put the name of the citizen scientists in the scientific papers. And I think that's an excellent way um, to, to encourage and garner citizen science to take, to take part. I also wanted to come back on, on data validation. Um, uh, again, a very interesting conversation with, with some colleagues in Australia who complained there was too much data coming back from the citizens and they couldn't validate it all. To which my riposte was, well, why do you need to validate it? Why don't you look out in the citizen science community for statisticians who will validate it for you? Or why don't you look at some of the work that's been going on in other universities to compare the citizen data with the expert data to work out the size of the data set that you need to reach before statistically they're both valid. And both approaches can be used, so there are solutions. Okay, can I, can I? There was another question here. Yeah, Rosemary from Strathmore University, Kenya. Uh, just wanted to learn from your experience if uh, diversity forms one of your indicators, the citizen uh, data and citizen uh, engagement. Diversity, I mean, in terms of uh, gender, disaggregated data, uh, disability, among others, or just because they are citizen, it's okay. Can, 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 can you repeat your question? I'm, I'm saying whether diversity forms one of the key indicators when you engage with citizen data. I guess what you're trying to say, if we um, are like a, when we are getting contributions from the citizens, if we are looking at the uh, demographic information, yes. yeah, there are some there there are some uh, studies and um, research about that. But I mean, we haven't. I mean, we only have done it in 
particular of some of our research, but I cannot give you the numbers now. Maybe in between we can, um, you can give me your email address and I can, I can forward you some of the information that we have. Is there anybody else from the citizen science community that can answer? What I was going to say, is, and Rosie might want to add to this, but um, there's certainly um, a biological monitoring program, the OPAL program in the UK, where they've got hard numbers on the percentages of the disadvantaged communities that got involved, if that's, if that's what you're referring to. So the, the different segments of the community, they actually measured the age structure, they measured the socioeconomic status of the individuals, and they had hard targets as part of the funding that they had to, to reach. So they adopted a different approach to engagement of the, uh, the, 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 the difficult to reach communities within the urban area. So there's some data around on that. Does that answer your question? Yes, but I wanted to know if um, you've actually adopted this as a, a principle. Uh, during the project design, while yeah. designing yeah, I think, the project? Yeah, I think this is the key. This is not, I mean, ideally this could be done and should be done, but it's not uh, always that easy. It depends a lot on how the project is initially set up. And, and it's sometimes not not possible and sometimes I think it's possible and in some more community based bottom up projects this is for sure possible and it depends a lot on the design. And it depends on the kind of project. I think if you look at SciStarter they ask for information when people are, are, are signing up and certainly in the, the, the biodiversity mapping project that we use um, we ask people who they are and what their name is and when they're signing up to be contributors. So we, we could do, I mean, we don't do the data analysis because it's a community project, but we, it's there. The metadata is there if we wanted to. So I think it depends. Um, I would like to also add to that is, um, like, in terms of the team that you are dealing with, within a citizen science initiative or a project. That also depends on that. We are mostly uh, working on the environmental projects. The, we haven't actually, to be honest, uh, thought of um, like um, involving this in the citizen science design design phase of the projects, like um, whether we should involve more gender, like uh, or we sh whether we should look at the gender more. But I think it's like if you're dealing with some community-related projects or projects with social um, goals, then it might make much more sense to look into uh, this as well. Yes, please. I had a quick point. So I, I'm from Asia, and I basically run the Association for Asia. So diversity is one of the big challenges for us, um, because if you take an example, just from a language standpoint, um, usually a lot of the projects are mostly run in English at the moment, um, especially from a global perspective. So what we're looking at, for example, within Asia, you have many, many languages, many cultures, and so there's also age and there's sort of gender. So I think the key point, just to echoing what they're saying, is that there is consideration for the fact that the data set does need to be diverse, so the basic premise of citizen science does th account for that, but are you making sure you're communicating your message? Are you making it available and accessible to the organization or the um, community? And so I think part of it is with the global partnership, top down is really understanding strategy to make sure that you're building in sort of the capacity to account for some of that stuff so that you are actually making it most as, as accessible as possible to people. Okay, any more questions? Any more burning questions? Okay, there are no more questions. So I would like to thank everybody, the speakers. We have heard some really great presentations We've heard a lot of information about citizen science. We are now all excited about the potential of citizen science and we'll go out and tell everybody here in, in Dubai. Um, so thanks also to the audience, to you having listened to you, to us for so long. Uh, so thanks everybody and the big clap for, for the audience. <laughs>